So hello and welcome back to How to Connect with Humans, the series that we created with Wayne Yates. Hello. Hello, how are you? I'm good, how are you? So nice to have you here. You too. <laughs> <laughs> so we are on episode 10. This is the last episode of our very first series and this was uh, created thinking about the conversations that City Banks had uh, in his own living room when he started sharing what he uncovered and what um, explained to him and then to us how our human experience works and um, it's, it's been a dream of us to do something like this and uh, we are so thankful to have to start with to have you because we wouldn't be here without you and um and today is very close to our heart because also i think i wouldn't be here we wouldn't be here if uh our dear friend especially my dear mentor jamie smart wouldn't be here um who is today at our episode 10 and uh jamie smart is a sunday times best-selling uh author a speaker and a coach and especially he's an amazing human being somebody that gives so much of himself to the people that train with him that are happy to be there to listen to um, this understanding that have absolutely changed our lives um, so is there anything you would like to say not at the moment no, no. is it um so, what's the name of the of the episode? Did we study for today? We did. Connection, clarity, <laughs> <laughs> and love. So, love, connection, and clarity. So, without much ado, I was close. You were close. <laughs> it's the same. It's the same. You, you say they, they're inter. What is it? Interlink. It, it, interlink, inter exchange. So, okay. So, <laughs> hello, Jamie. How are you? Sorry for the long So far, so good. So <laughs> far, so good. You know, our mutual friend, Liz Scott, once introduced me as Jamie Smart Sunday Times best smelling author. <laughs> which I, I was one of the finest compliments. I think it was a slip of the tongue, but I'll still take it. So, um, <laughs> so love clarity and connection and i was just as i was listening to you uh uh kind of explain about the the because i the thing you said about um that it was inspired by what sid banks used to do was having people around his living room and just sharing what he'd seen i didn't i didn't know that until i heard you say it today and i really like that i really like that like one of the things one of the things I love about this understanding is that, you know, back back when I first back when I first got into kind of personal development and spirituality and all that sort of stuff, I was I was looking at what are the limits I can take the human neurology to and that sort of thing. Like I was trying to, you know. Uh, speed time up or slow time down and try to do all these things. And one day my then wife said to me, she said, Katie, she said, uh, you know, you might like to spend uh, a little less time trying to be superhuman and put a little more attention on being human. And, and it was a very astute comment. And one of the things I love about this understanding is how over the course of you know 10 or 11 years kind of slowly and gently mostly slowly and mostly gently but utterly relentlessly it's kind of been softening me up and making me more human it's sort of like the uh the spiritual equivalent of meat tenderizer and that turns out to have a lot going for it. Like I, I, uh, 
I would never have thought all those years ago when I first started looking in the direction of, you know, all, all this stuff that, that we're interested in. I never would have thought back when I was buying books on personal development and all that sort of stuff, that the answer would be, you already have what you're looking for. You already are what you've been searching for. Uh, and while there may be all sorts of things that you're aspired, inspired to, to create or do or accomplish or change or experiment with or whatever, there's nothing you need to do in order to be okay. There's nothing, you don't need any things to be any particular. <laughs> Bless you to have a beautiful life. And uh, you already are everything you've been searching for until now. And I expect people were saying something like that back then, but it was, uh, whoosh, it went right over my head. So uh, I feel very, very grateful to be here today and to have, have uh, been fortunate enough to be introduced to the, these principles, to this understanding. Because, you know, when I first got introduced to it, I, everyone referred to it as the best kept secret in psychology. And it still is a pretty well kept secret, but not nearly as well kept as it used to be, I'm glad to say. You know, the level of interest in this understanding is high. I feel very grateful to have been, to, to have found it, to have stumbled across it, to have been introduced to it. And I feel very grateful for the, the blessings that it's brought into my life. And, and so as we're preparing for this, I was thinking about the, you know, the subject of love, clarity, and connection. And, and the, it's funny, you know, a lot of times when I'm sharing this understanding in my, in my way, the way that makes sense to me, People sometimes say, well, what, why don't you talk about mind more? And my answer is, well, I do. It's just I call it connection. It's just a different word, but it's the same thing. Like, And so I thought it might be fun to kind of start there. And, and the, the, way, the way it certainly looks to me is that there's, there's a, a useful distinction, which is between the the experience of connection, which is, you know, we all like the, as far as I can tell, pretty much everyone likes uh, the experience of connection, which is, you know, the, the kind of the falling away of the illusion of separation and the falling into connection with another person with who you really are with life itself with that you know deeper wisdom and intelligence behind life so so everyone likes the the experience of connection the feeling of connection and the experience of love and connection it, it comes and goes it ebbs and flows like and that's so natural and so human because because we can never you know we never feel exactly the same way for an extended period of time or rarely. Like it's natural that it ebbs and flows. But certainly, you know, what I found is it does a lot for people to, to realize that it's already there. It's already there. It's, so once you know it, it's sort of like, uh, I don't know, it's sort of like, it, it's it, it's sort of like your head. You don't have to go around keep checking that you've still got one. Like it's it's pretty evident, and doesn't mean you have to be aware of having a head all the time. But but uh, life would be a lot more uncomfortable if you rel rel regularly went. Where have I put my head? Where have I put my head? Where's my head? Oh dear, I seem to have misplaced my head. I've and you know, like I can be like that with my glasses actually. Where are my glasses? Where are my glasses? There's a way in which, there's a way in which, you know, just having them on a string around your neck makes a big difference. Um, but it's it's sort of the same with with connection. Once you realize 
where it lives, where it is, where it comes from, what it is, it becomes much less concerning when, uh, when we lose sight of it, when it, you know, when it ebbs and flows. It's, it's like it's nothing to get worried about which ironically makes it easier to find your way back to it. So anyway, how it looks to me is that when you're in the experience of connection, the felt experience of connection, you're connected to, you know, other people, to, to who you really are and to life itself. And so that is that, you know, connection, the felt connection to the wisdom and intelligence of life. But there's that if that's the experience of connection, there's also the fact of connection. And the fact of connection is a different kettle of fish because the fact of connection is that you're always connected. You're always connected to everyone else and to who you really are and to the wisdom and intelligence of life. You're connected when you can see it and you're connected when you can't. You're connected when you're feeling it and you're connected when you don't. Because there's a way in which, see, I started this by saying I like the word connection. But actually the word connection has some misgiving, is it has some limitations. Like if I, if I, choosing an object at random, take this CD by Q Burns abstract message, and I wanted to connect it to my phone, I would have to get a piece of string or a rubber band or some tape and connect one to the other. And so we think of connection as you've got two separate things and then they're connected together with something. And that's what the word connection kind of implies. But actually how it looks to me is there's, there's only one thing. And so when I talk about connection, what I'm really talking about is the absence of the illusion of separation. So you may have heard me say that uh, we're not human beings having a spiritual experience. We're one spiritual being having seven billion human experiences. And who you really are is that one spiritual being. And that's who I really am, and that's how, that's who all your friends really are, and that's who, you know, Joe Biden and Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton really are, and that's who, the guy who's doing a drug overdose right now really is, and that's who the person delivering toys to sick children really is, and that's who uh, all the birds and insects and animals and fish in the sea really are. We're all that one spiritual being having billions and billions of experiences. And so if who you really are is that one spiritual being, then there's, there's not two, there's just one. And that one spiritual being is what's creating all of our experience. And so what, it's totally natural, totally human, the most normal thing in the world to experience the illusion of separation. We all do, we all do. And it's also totally natural to fall awake from that, to fall into, fall awake to the truth of who we are, to the oneness of life, to the, the peace and beauty of the present moment to wake up. So we get to experience both. Of course, 
We say we get to experience both, but when you fall awake from the illusion of separation, then I don't even know who it is that's experiencing that, but uh, I guess it would be that one being. So anyway, I, th I think, you know, when people talk about love, when people talk about peace, when people talk about clarity and connection and all of this, what we're really talking about is awakening from the illusion of separation and coming home to who we really are. And so I thought that might just be a good kind of starter for Ken for this uh, conversation this evening. Really is. And um, I wish we had everybody muted because already the feeling is. Yeah. Yeah. As, as soon as you were doing that, I kind of knew exactly what you were, what yeah. you were feeling because I feel exactly the same. It's just like everything's just kind of just dropped. Yeah. It's beautiful. And I remember when I came up um, with a name for this, and I thought, well, I'm re is this ridiculous to call this like how to connect with humans? Because it's like, okay, I'm going to do a course of flexibility for cats. You know, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> it's not a course, but yeah, for a series of talks of how, you know. Um, and then I thought, one of the most important things I learned during this probably five years uh, we've been I've been um, sort of uh, training with with you Jamie and going to courses and uh, has absolutely changed my life and I remember you drawing these circles on the chart and and then there were like connection calibration and education and when we know about this understanding we all go huge on education it's like we all want to just get it out there and tell people about it and i was very much there and, and very much there a lot of the time but <laughs> the the connection and calibration that you were pointing at was um for me what i heard was just like just see people, just see people for who they are. Just because that is when, when your personal thinking is out of the way and you drop out of that and we're saying like, the feeling here is just like drops, like you're, then that's when we are available to, to be away from that illusion of separation when you can for my liking you can connect to everybody everybody and i may have preferences on what do i like on how people act about certain things or how donald trump as you were mentioned mentioning sort of like decides to do with his presidency and um but for sure there will be a place i could sit down get to know more about his world, calibrate about my perception of him without really knowing him, and then have a connective conversation with a human being that at the end of the day, I'm sure he thinks he's doing the right thing. And, and I don't know, I mean, I don't know if he's or he isn't, um, I have my preferences and my ideas. But that's what stops us from being separated, even if you have the most opposite personal thinking about certain things. Yeah, and I mean, in terms of, you know, we all run into people who are doing things which, you know, maybe we wouldn't do or wouldn't agree with or that sort of thing. And one of the things that's very clear to me is that every single person is doing what makes sense to them given their current level of understanding and if you or i had their thinking we'd be their understanding we'd be doing that too uh and, and i don't see any exception to that whether we're talking about you know 
armed robbers or Nobel Prize winners or regardless that every every single person is doing what makes sense to them given their current level of understanding doesn't mean they're what that I'm okay with what they're doing doesn't mean that if they do it around me they're not going to get a punch in the nose or something but, <laughs> but I know that they're doing what makes sense to them in that moment now what what makes sense to them in that moment may not be uh may not be safe to be around so you know you, that's why we have common sense we the the principles aren't as far as i see it about going oh everyone's lovely all the time it's like no there are people out there doing terrible things so you know be careful and wear your seat belt and <laughs> be careful when petting lions and that sort of thing but that's why we have common sense to to kind of guide us in in what to do and what not to do and that sort of thing yeah I love it because at the moment I've got some issues going on with my brother and me and Carolina have spoken a couple of times and it's been like, you want to be here to support him, but at the same time, you don't want to take the crap he's dealing out. And it's so amazing when you said like, you, you don't have to, you don't have to kind of like, the common sense is there to kind of go, you know what? I'm here, but I'm not going to take that. Yeah, and that's fine. Yeah. That's fine. And, and you know, there's something about, you know, you can, you can really, really love someone to bits and not take their shit. And that's okay. And sometimes the most loving thing you can do is be clear about what is and isn't okay with you. And here's the thing, you know, I might say to someone, you know what, that's not okay. And that sort of thing. I may not be seeing it right, but what else are you going to do? You're going to, you, you want to call it like you see it, be true to yourself and trust that you and the other person have the capacity to see more about a situation. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's very liberating to, and the, the other thing I really like about it, Wayne, is when we really, really get that everyone's doing what makes sense to them at their level of understanding. And by the way, I don't always really get that depending on what they're up to. Uh, but when we, when we get it, even notionally, like, come on, everyone's doing the best thing it kind of removes judgment from the situation and, and, and opens the door to compassion and forgiveness, knowing that if we saw it like that, we'd be doing that too. It kind of depersonalizes it. Mm. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. I, I, I remember for me, part of uh, what happened um, during these years is that um, I always thought that my goal and I misunderstood a lot of like maybe the way I saw people like Gandhi and you know and Martin Luther King and I just thought well what you have to be is like really loving and accepting and and now after after many things we talk about and and being for and, and and I want to say that um, when you are on a training course for uh, a certain period of time, that gives you the opportunity of seeing in that direction um, and being with other people that are also looking in that direction. Mm. And there's a wonderful skill of being able to teach these principles in the way you do because for me I completely re-understood what being loving and being connected was that I didn't have to be all loving permissive and it doesn't matter what you do I just want you to like me and it, it, whatever uh, so 
um, I put in a comment when you asked, like, I think you asked something or like, what was one of the moments, one of your groups, like, and uh, that was really, this understanding was really important for me was to put limit to my dad that was very abusive. Mm-hmm. And the more he got to the end of his life with morphine and sort of misbehaving with his medication and stuff, the more abusive he was. And because he was in Argentina, I couldn't just uh, go there and come back whenever I just sort of like, oh, okay, it's abusive. He lived in a house in the middle of nowhere. like, And this took us so many conversations. And uh, I felt that I was being the worst daughter ever until I had this insight that was, well, I need to take care of myself. And, and if I don't feel loving or understanding, that's okay. Mm. And the fact that I didn't go and put myself uh, or put myself and my daughter in risk being there in that house, um for for whatever period of time um was a difficult decision but was m- probably one of the most loving decisions i had towards me towards him us my daughter um because yeah, after that I felt liberated. And I think one of the things is that wisdom gives you what you need. Mm-hmm. And then you can deal with things that um, would have been difficult. Like if you, if you are going to um, say demonstrate or try to talk to somebody about uh, rights of whatever kind, and somebody you feel are doing the, right, the wrong thing, um the more clear and the more connected you can be to somebody like that the best conversation you can have or you can remove yourself from situations that could be harmful that's that's my understanding from what we've done together in a way and it makes a lot of sense to me like often paradoxically paradoxical as it may sound the kindest thing you can do for someone else is to be true to yourself in your own you know your own uh just doing what makes sense to you and they won't always thank you for it right away but (laughs) it 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 can genuinely be a kindness you know you'll you'll often find people say oh yeah when you when you did that or said that it really woke me up you know, it or it, I had to have a look at what I was doing or whatever. So, so yeah, there's a there's a, a quote that I love by Marianne Williamson. She said, uh, "Well, you, you guys will know the quote, but it's the last few stanzas." She says, um, "When we uh, when we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give." others permission to do the same as we are liberated from our own fear our presence automatically liberates others and there's something about being true to yourself letting your own light shine not require not shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you uh, not taking shit from people because you think you need to because that's your role or whatever. Just being true to yourself, letting your light shine, calling it like you see it is a gift that sometimes people don't say thank you for, but it is a gift that you're giving not just to yourself, but to others as well. Even the ones who you rub up the wrong way.
So is, is now a good time to take questions or do coaching or what's, you know, I'm happy to, to do whatever is going to be useful or make sense to people. It's an absolute great time. So let's, um, first we're going to let your, you, you unmute. No, mine is just going to do the little technical thing so people can unmute themselves. And, um, and so please either you can write on the comments the questions or you can raise your hand or you can just unmute yourself now um if you would like to ask a question or have a reflection or if you would like actually the opportunity of having jamie coaching you on something which is an amazing opportunity I have to say. go ahead michelle um <clears throat> Do you know, I just want to say thank you. Well, not just want to say thank you, but this, I've had yet another wow moment. I've had so many insights since, well, I don't even know. They've, they've started coming a while ago. I would say about six weeks ago, but they've been more intense in the last two or three days. And what you just what you were just talking about about um you know having common sense i i kind of have been on oh so it's a bit of a cliche but i've been on a bit of a journey for the last i would say 18 months or so and i've read a lot of marianne williamson i've read and i know you've read jamie the secret and i kind of misunderstood the secret um, I kind of got the feeling that, um, I don't know how, how Carolina put it, that you have to be like lovely to everybody and they can do whatever they want to you, but you still have to love them. And I've realized over the last few days that actually that's, that's, that's not right. Um, and that it's not about being unkind to them I can still understand them I can still have complete compassion but I also have respect for myself and taking care of myself is and always will now be my priority and right it's, it is so liberating to to have that and honestly when you were first talking i mean caroline and wayne no i love absolutely love them to bits i really do um but i i love you too as well well i love everybody let's just like everybody i felt special there for a second <laughs> <laughs> well, I love you more than the spider that's in my bath right now. Uh. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. It's just like this level of peace has descended upon me. Mm. And it's the most amazing gift I've ever received in my life. And I, c I could actually get quite emotional about it because all of a sudden i've realized that my pure existence is enough and i i've been reading um anita mariani's dying to be me book mm -hmm. and in there she talks about her near-death experience and the you know the oneness and it's really hard to put it into words, um, but go, going back to, to where I was at, the you can still love everybody, but it doesn't mean to say you have to like them. Yeah, exactly. I guess, I guess that's my way of putting it, and that that's for me. That's been, <clears throat> you know, you having that discussion with Carolina has just like cemented that because i was still feeling a little bit like oh yeah but you know that guy that i know that drinks himself to a stupor to 
numb his pain, I really, I really feel for him and I've got so much compassion and love for him. But ultimately, you know, that isn't, that's not necessary. that's not okay with me. You know, and I, I can make that choice. And having listened to you and Carolina have that discussion has just, you know, cemented that for me and made me feel like, no, that actually, Michelle, that's okay. That's It's okay to look after yourself and to put yourself as a priority. Yeah. So, really thank well. you. You're so and, welcome. And I, and I really, really appreciate everything you shared, Jamie. Honestly, it's been... It's been life changing to have the opportunity to have met Carolina and Wayne and th the whole Clarity Pro thing. Just, I am so, so grateful that this has come to me. I really am. I know the feeling, me, like me too, Michelle. I, I, I don't know if this will resonate with you, but I, I feel very, very lucky and fortunate indeed to have stumbled across this understanding because uh, it would have been just as easy for me not to. And uh, yeah. it just feel very lucky. So, yeah, yeah same here. Thank you anyway. You're very I'll let, welcome. I'll let someone else have a chat. All right, Michelle, lovely to connect with you. Susie's got her hand up. So, Susie? Hi, Susie. Lovely to see you. Hello. Hi. Hi, Jamie. Hello. Um, so, uh, yeah, you know how, so people all around the world can reach an understanding of, of who they are, mm -hmm. right, with, with, without knowing about the principles, of course. Sure. And some people know it innately and just never and never lose it. And, um, and I guess my first real experience of it was was with you. I think probably up in front of the room, and and then also with Chip and Jan, and and you know. So I say this from a place of absolute humility and gratitude. But why? I mean, I I, I when I teach this stuff, I I, I barely. I pay tribute to the three principles, but I barely talk about it. Talk, talk about mind consciousness and thought, probably because of my understanding of it, perhaps. But why, why, in your opinion, do we need the three principles? I guess that's you know to under to, to teach it. Got it. Well, uh, and I can I'll give you my take on it, Susie. Uh, It, it can be useful to distinguish between, see the, 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 the words, the three principles. It, it can, even when you say something like, why do we need the three principles to teach it? It, mean, it depends what you mean by the three principles. So one of the things uh, that the three principles refers to is three formless energies which is really just one energy, the intelligent energy behind life, uh, which is mind that was, uh, you know, kind of, and, and it's a way of expressing it that Sid Banks insightfully, he insightfully had realizations about the nature of this. And so when we say the three principle, principles, we can be referring to that formless energy. And there aren't actually three of them. It's just one thing because it's before form. So if it's before form, it's got no uh, divisions or anything. So it's just one thing. But it's just so it's a way of... So, then, so the first thing we can sometimes mean when we talk about the three principles is that formless energy. Mm. And then the, the next thing we can be referring to is those three words, you know, the, the articulation of that by said... But another thing that the three principles often refers to is the three principles community. And another thing it often refers to is the belief systems and values uh, held by many members of that community, which is all thought generated, obviously. Mm -hmm. And another thing it can refer to as a, a modality of change work, 
And another thing of, it can refer to it is a way of educating people in that and in these principles. And another thing it can refer to, which I didn't realize until 2011 when I ran afoul of it, is a brand. And so it depends when you say, why do we need the three principles? Here's how it looks to me. I, I've, can I share a slide, Carolina? Can you enable, enable uh, sharing so that I can share my screen? Just a sec. I just want, there's one slide that I want to show you guys. I don't know. I mean. There's a little arrow next to the share button. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. So it's just this one. I and I wanted to so this is this is about what I do. Like I see my my job to be awaken to awaken people to the truth of this understanding and support them in awakening others. Uh, so it's waking people up to who they really are. And and I've found Sid's coding, if you like, or articulation of the principles to be useful for that. But I see my job description is to help make it as easy as possible for people to have the insights and realizations that will make a genuine difference in their lives. That's my job is to help create the conditions for insight, help make it easy for people to have insight. Now, Susie, it's pretty rare that in the course of doing that job, that it makes sense for me to go, so there are these three principles, mind, thought, and consciousness. I almost never do, it just never, it never, or it rarely makes sense to me mm. to talk about it in that way. It's made a great deal of sense for me to learn about it in something like that way. But my, I don't see my job as being to tell people about there are these three principles. I see my job as being to help people have insights and realizations that'll make a difference to them. And what I've noticed is that there are two directions I can point in that seem to be like rocket fuel for helping people have those insights. And the first one of those is pointing people in the direction of where their experience is coming from. And it looks to us like we're, we're living in a, in a world of things and people and experiences when in actual fact we're living in the experience of the principle of thought taking form in the moment. And that, that confusion, that, that can be useful to clear people, to clear up for people, but the thing that really does the heavy lifting, like the purpose of pointing people to that, the, where their experience is coming from is purely because it's a really, seems to be a relatively easy way for people to, to kind of open a door for people to have insights into who they really are, which is really what does the heavy, from my perspective, the, the thing that's going to, it can be useful for a person to, be very useful for a person to realize that they're living in the experience of thought that can be very valuable and one of the things that's nice about it is it's something that's kind of operationalizable you know you can you can if you're freaked out or worried or confused or whatever you can look at that and it's like oh, okay there's something to see there mm. But the thing that's going to change a person's life is seeing more deeply the truth of who you really are. That's the thing that's going to do the heavy lifting. Now, neither of those things require you to talk about there are these three principles. It might make, might make sense for you to do so, but it might not. And I've certainly got nothing to say about how you should talk about it or how anyone else should talk about it. So here's something I said earlier, Susie, is that uh, everyone's doing what makes sense to them at their current level of understanding. 
And so I encourage everyone to do whatever makes sense to them at their current level of understanding, because that's what they're going to do anyway. So, so I, I want them to do it with my blessing. And, and so I don't have anything to say about how you should talk about the principles. In fact, it looks to me like the, the most leveraged way to help make it easy for people to have insights into this understanding is to find your way into the experience of connection with them. You find your way into the experience of connection with them. They're going to have insights. And you, you find your way into the experience of connection with them. They're going to have insights without you even mentioning principles a lot of the time. And so I think it's the important thing isn't for you to tell people that there are these three principles. I don't think the important thing is even for you to know that there are these three principles. The important thing it looks to me is for you to know who you are, to know where your experience is coming from. And to know that if you kind of set the controls for the experience of connection, this is in one-to-one -one work and group work now, but if I, if I say, like if I sit down with a group or a one-to-one -one client or whatever, I'm like, okay, where am I headed with this person? It's like, well, I'm going to head, there's an there's a, a old Pink Floyd song. I used to love when I was a kid, really, really early Pink Floyd song called uh, Set the Controls for the Heart of the Sun. And that's, that's, that's what it makes sense to me to do. I just set the controls for the heart of the sun. That's where we're going. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know how we're going to get there. I don't know what it's going to make sense to say or ask or do. I know that if I set the controls for the heart of the sun and I'm finding my way with my client together into that place of peace and connection and clarity, and I'm looking in the direction of the unknown, of what I don't know, that, that that's what I found makes it as easy as possible for both of us to have the insights and realizations that are going to make a difference. And the cool thing is when I'm doing that, I only realized this recently when I'm working like that, I'm modeling for my client, the very thing that's going to make a difference to them. So if I want my client to be available to insight and to look in the direction of the source of all creation and to look in the orient themselves towards the unknown the most the most powerful way i can do that is by the power of example by doing the same thing myself so by being willing to not know and by being willing to not know like and here's a case in point that thing that i said about set the controls for the heart of the sun i have never said that to anybody ever in my life mm. it came to me i was like i like that pink flag. and it came to me again it came to me and i was like okay say it boom yeah yeah it's, ah. it's great yeah and so, but, but that came from looking in the direction of insight, looking in this direction. So I want to kind of practice what I'm preaching. Now, if that had some impact for you or for anybody on this call, it won't be because I correctly used the words mind, thought, and consciousness in the right order at the right time. Like there, and I I'm, I'm, don't think I'm demeaning or diminishing anything. Like I have the most colossal respect and admiration and appreciation for Sid Banks and what he articulated and discovered, insightfully discovered. I, I think that his realization of these principles is 
quite possibly the most the 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 most momentous discovery in human history like it it looks extraordinary to me and it and the fact of what Sid uncovered and articulated is incredibly important to me the fact of it the fact that who you really are is consciousness itself the fact that you've already got what you've been searching for the fact that you're living in the experience of this divine, like this thing, you know, my way of talking about it, Susie, is you're living in the experience of the principle of thought taking form in the moment, 100% of the time, no exception. So that's how I like, like, but lots of people, that doesn't resonate with them. I said, well, don't worry about that. Here's another way of saying it. You're living in the experience of God breathing life into reality moment by moment. Or you're living in the feeling of the infinite, infinite intelligence of the universe, creating a perceptual reality in every second. You're like, like they're all just way, the, the important bit is that it's all being created from this, in, this divine energy uh, and, that it's, and that we're living in the experience of that rather than in the objects of thought. That's the important bit, not what words you hang on it. If you listen to the early recordings, people will say, oh yeah, Sid was saying mind consciousness and thought right from the beginning. Nah, no, 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 he wasn't. He was, he, but he saw with great clarity the truth of this understanding, the constant nature of it, the 100% nature of it right from the get-go. That's clear to me listening to him. It's cl so clear to me that he saw it with utter clarity and precision right from the get-go. And then he spent the next 40 years trying to figure out how to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like it was 96 before it was encoded as principles. It's so over 20 years later before anyone said anything about principles. Yeah, yeah, I was talking to him. Um, chip last week actually chip Chapman briefly and and yeah and he he was saying that but right from the start he was talking about divine mind and divine consciousness and divine thought it just hadn't transcended into the principles basically hadn't sort of yeah yeah but so 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 in your experience the three principles I just it's just it's a more helpful way of directing people towards the sun than just um than say the non-duality approach which obviously is oh, i'm very specific on this so let me be crystal clear on this every mystical tradition every spiritual tradition throughout history has had the notion of a divine intelligence, a divine consciousness, that sort of thing, yeah. um, and and of oneness. This mm -hmm. is uh, every every single one of them has had it. Um, the th the innovation, in my opinion. So if if Sid had had his experience where he saw that it was all all was oneness and white buzzing and all that sort of stuff but didn't have the other one, then he would have been in the pantheon of people who had had the, the full non-dual experience and uh, were experiencing fairly persistent non-dual awareness going forward. Mm -hmm. uh, and there have been tons of those people throughout history. Uh, maybe not tons, but lots of them. Lots mm -hmm. of them. They write books and that sort of thing. But Sid, see, see if you take like, let's take the big ones like Buddha or Jesus or uh, Muhammad, peace be upon him, or any of the other kind of very notable folks historically who were, you know, founders of major religions and stuff. They had those insights long before the metaphor of scientific principles even existed. The notion of scientific principles like pre-existing laws it's a very recent innovation like 1600s or something that's very recent if you think in big spans of time yeah. so so jesus as far as i can tell had 
it, the same kind of experience saw the truth of who we really are. And, you know, that's, you'll hear people talk about Christ consciousness and stuff. If he didn't know about scientific principles, because science hadn't been invented yet. The, the system of discovery uh, that allows us to learn about the natural world hadn't been uh, figured out yet. And so the thing that looks to me unique in what Sid realized is the 100% nature of the thought-feeling connection. The other bit, the non-dual bit, all, everyone's got that. I, 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 don't, I don't mean to diminish it. That's, you, if you start exploring spiritual traditions, you'll, you'll trip over the, the non-dual experience in very short order. And the, the thing you see with that is that people who are drawn to that experience will study for years and do meditation and uh, take vows of silence, do all kinds of stuff. A Sid saw, oh no, this is principles. Mm. This is principles. And the thing about principles, if you take a step back from, it's very, it's, it's simple, but there's a depth to it. And it's this, Susie. You, you, you learned uh, to walk and to, you learned all kinds of stuff about the print, about the implications of the principles of gravity, the, the principle of gravity. And you learned them automatically. You didn't, you didn't take a vow of gravity uh, compliance and go away to a gravity ashram and, and uh, kneel at the feet of the guru and learn to speak in the special gravity friendly language so that you could get good at gravity. As soon as you got eyes for gravity, which you did as soon as you were born, because it's super obvious, you started learning about the fact of the implications of gravity. Yeah. And learning about that has made a huge difference to your life. If you met someone who came from somewhere where there was no gravity and they had to hang out with you for a day, they would have a rough ride. It would be tough because you've learned so much and you use what you've learned automatically without even thinking about it. Well, that's because gravity is a principle and as human beings, we have a built-in capacity for learning from reality, learning from raw data. So what Sid saw is, this is principles. You don't need to go away and do practices and that sort of thing. You just need to see it for what it is and you will start learning about it. You start seeing the truth of these principles. They will guide you into a deeper state of awareness. They will guide you. They will, well, he says, those three principles left alone will guide you from the most deplorable situations to happiness, no matter what. Mm. Now, as far as I can tell, what he was talking about was the knowledge of who you really are and the fact of the 100% nature of the thought-feeling connection. And he used to say, he used to say, uh, it's love and understanding. It's love and understanding. Love. And people hear that and they think, oh, yeah, you need to be understanding. That's not what he's talking about. It's his love, his, his big insight. Is, oh, love is our nature. We are that one being. We are already connected to everything and everyone. Love is our nature. Love and understand. understanding. Understanding, understanding the 100% nature of the thought-feeling connection. He used to say again and again and again, thought is the missing link. He's talking about the principle of thought, not the things you're thinking, the principle of thought. And if you go through all the spiritual traditions, they've all got consciousness. They've all got mind or some flavor of mind. They don't have thought. They, Sid is the first, as far as I can tell, Sid is the first person in all history who, who identified the 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 unity of thought and feeling 
the principle of thought and feeling. That, to me, is the thing that is distinct about this understanding. The cool thing about it is with that, you can teach some, you can talk to someone who is entirely unmotivated to live a contemplative life and they will have insights into the truth of who they really are. Yeah. Whereas every other tradition I've ever seen, the only people who get it are the people who get hit by accident, like spontaneously, like Sid did, or the people who commit to a life of serious contemplation and meditation and that sort of thing. So to me, this, this understanding that Sid realized and the reason he saw oh, this, is, this is the future of psychology, this holds the key to peace on earth, is because it democratizes it, because it's something... You say to someone, hey, you're, you're, uh, you are, you're God. Most people will go, okay, thanks for clearing that up. If you, say, if you say, do you think that you're a physical, who you are is a physical body? They're like, what do you mean? <laughs> what are you trying to say? It's like you, you, that for most normal people, those are hard conversations to have. Whereas what I found with this understanding is there's some pretty easy conversations to have that will lead people into a profound realization of the truth of who they are. Yeah. Uh, so that's why this looks utterly distinct and new. Now, Susie, to me anyway, that doesn't rely on you saying there are these three principles. Yeah, yeah. no, I get that, yeah. But yeah. your understanding of the principles is, is crucial to that. Yeah. But so, so I mean, so the the point really is is that Sid discovered the principles. It's not it's not that he created the principles. Yeah, to help us. He, he he realized that 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 he realized that you could. So even talking about it as principles is a metaphor. Yeah, but it's a metaphor that wasn't available two thousand years ago. It's a met just like if if I if I use a metaphor of a mobile phone. To say, well, you know, just like, just like uh, this phone was made three years ago, but the internet was made 50 years ago. And this phone was born into the internet. And when it switches off, it'll, you know, the internet will still be going. Well, it's the same with consciousness. You were born into consciousness and you're, you dialed into it. Well, that metaphor didn't exist before mo mobile phones existed. So that the metaphor of scientific principles, and Sid saw this, in a much more profoundly principled way than anyone else through history, is how I see it anyway. Can't tell you how helpful that is. Thank you, Jamie. <laughs> is it that you can't tell me because it's not very helpful, or is it be? <laughs> no, that's great. That's amazing. It's been whirling around for a while, so uh, no, that that's really. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, you're so welcome. You're yeah. so welcome. It's lovely to see you, Martine. It's lovely to see you. Hi, I just have five minutes. <laughs> Even I've five just minutes. got five minutes too. Then I've got to have my dinner, so it's we're 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 perfectly lined up. Okay, it's about exceptions. I know all those stuff, but family. No, family seems to be like a blank spot, right? Probably, yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, my sister has been in a tailspin, a mental uh, tailspin for the last three months. And she'd been phoning me the first two months, like three hours. <laughs> uh, now it's, I managed uh, 10 minutes because my patient is not there anymore. And um, keep pointing now, stop thinking the future, stop now the past the moment when well, I'm in my moment is not good that because this is this is happening right now when on your phone with me you now you're you're okay you now and I uh, I got another 3p person talk to her uh, she finished a super coach because she's she's also francophone my sister doesn't speak English and I know <laughs> No, people, oh, my heart goes to that person because it is a mental tailspin. No, I'm just, no, wake up. No, I've been trained to oh, yeah, it's this frustrating, right? Too much. No, <laughs> wake up. Um, yeah, so family seems to be a blind spot, and sometimes it makes it harder uh, to keep patient with 
It doesn't sound like a blind spot. It sounds like it's just like hard having uh, having someone who's really struggling and and who you know the thing with often with friends and family and that sort of thing. The big difference between having someone who you're paying to help you out with something versus family and friends is often people will talk to family and friends about stuff that they don't really want to change. They're just like the, the and I'm not saying that's true of your sister, but it's often like the, it's kind of, I remember uh, hearing a story about Virginia Satir, the famous family therapist. And, uh, she was asked, what's the most powerful force in human beings? What's the most powerful force in human beings? And she thought about it and she said, the desire for the familiar, the desire for things to say the same. And if you think about it, the word familiar comes from the word family. They come from the same root. And in family systems, one of the things that appears to be the case is there's a, a, a certain amount of uh, something, I don't want to say pressure, but there's a, a almost like a, there's a, a homeostasis that will endeavor to keep things the same and stop things from changing too much. And uh, I, so I was so anyway. Virginia said, "The desire to keep things the same is the most powerful force in people." So I was talking to another mentor of mine, a brilliant linguist called Chris Smith, and I t uh, Chris Smith, Chris Hall, and I told her this story, Christina. I told her this story about what Virginia had said. And Christina said, Christina is a brilliant woman. She said, I know something more powerful. I said, what's that, Christina? And she said, uh, purpose, purpose. And I don't know what the nature of your sister's tailspin is, Martine. But what I know for sure is this. Whatever, whatever it is that whatever the nature of her tailspin is, whether that's anxiety or worry or depression or whatever flavor of insecurity is what it is. Whatever flavor of insecurity she has. The reason she's even talking about it is because there's something she's inspired to bring into being in her life. There's something that, that, make, that matters to her and this tailspin is getting in the way of that. And that the thing that might, can I tell you a quick story and then I'll go, cause I know you have to go like in one minute, so I'll make it really fast. So you've heard me tell this, so I'll tell it very fast. When Dorothy and Robin and I were doing the workshop for youth workers, we thought, what's the number one gift we could give these youth workers? We thought it would be to see the capacity for mental health and well being uh, and resilience that the young people they support already have within them. And that's what I would love for you, Martine. I would love for you to catch an even deeper glimpse of the capacity for wisdom and resilience and mental health and well-being that your sister already has. Because I know with a family member, with a loved one who's struggling, it can be easy to lose sight of that temporarily. But the more we remember that, the more we are aware of that, the easier it is to, to follow our own wisdom and guidance in like you've already done to get the calls down to 10 minutes. That's wisdom. That's wisdom. So you already have it. I know you've got an appointment, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to keep going. It's lovely to see you. 
Thank you. No mistakes. <laughs> I've got to go, guys. Thank you so much for being here. Like, it's absolutely amazing. And uh, thank you for closing our first series ever. <laughs> <laughs> Hugely inspired that connection, and here you are. Um, so thank you very much for everybody to be in here. If you want to stay a few minutes, we'll say goodbye to, to Jamie so he can go and have his dinner. He's been teaching all day long. But, um, I'm teaching please, again in 40 I'm minutes. teaching again. So before you do that, where can people find you? Oh, just go to jamiesmart.com or all the usual, you know, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. The Clarity Life Community on Facebook is a free Facebook group. Just ask to join and I'll add you there and we're doing stuff in there all the time. So uh, yeah, head over to Clarity Life. And I would like to say also that uh, one of the things that we said to you uh, during those years very quickly is that uh, we, we really wanted you to create something that was really impactful and that was accessible for the pocket and so, uh, and you have done that. So Clarity Pro is amazing and I'm not having any percentage given by Jamie by saying <laughs> it, <you> don't. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, my hat off to you because you created something that is uh, accessible and gives an absolutely tons of uh, help material courses, things. So uh, please, go there and uh and let's let you have dinner <laughs> well, that's a very kind thing to say when they get there they'll find that the doors are closed at the moment we're not taking any new members for a few months but uh but but i still really appreciate your kind words so be there for what is it like uh the end of the year or something that the that doors the end of the year. Yeah. <laughs> thanks guys lots of love to you all love. bye, bye.